Welcome to Trifles, a weekly podcast about the Sherlock Holmes stories. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Yes, the cyclist was solitary, the bachelor was noble, and the resident was patient. But there are so many other details to pick apart in the stories. Pray be precise as to details. You know the plots, but what about the minutia? On which three continents did Watson have experience of women? When did 221B Baker Street first get telephone service? And why does Holmes prefer telegrams over writing? You are very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't know. Scott Monty and Bert Wolder will have the answers to these questions and more in trifles. The game's afoot. Episode 198: Clothes in the Canon. Hello there, and welcome to Trifles, the Sherlock Holmes podcast, where we talk about the details in the Sherlock Holmes stories, so you don't have to. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Wolder. And Bert, are you suited up and ready to go today? Oh, yes, I am. I'm, you know, it's the afternoon here. It's an October day, so I'm wearing my usual frock coat, white tie, tails, gaiters. You know, the problem is I have so many articles of clothing. I like to wear them all at once. <laughs> oh, I was going to say that sounds suitable, but, you know, that ensemble, I wouldn't put you in a department store window with that. The amazing, the advantage is that when you go to the supermarket, you always get right into the checkout line for some reason. I can't figure out why. (laughs) Well, that's what happens when you don't wear a mask. Well, this is episode 198 of Trifles, as I mentioned, and you can find the show notes for this episode at ihose.co slash trifles198. That'll take you to SherlockHolmesPodcast.com, which is our website, directly to the show notes for this episode. Any links that we talk about, anything that we feel you need to know more about is on that page. If you'd like to follow us along, uh, follow along with us on social media, we are I Hear of Sherlock in all of the usual places. And feel free to sign up and subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. You can do that on our website via email or you can do it in the podcast player of your choice. We appreciate any support you throw our way, whether it's a review or financial support. There's a variety of ways to do that. Check it out on the site. Let's get on with the show. Good idea. Well, Bert, you and I are known to be clothes horses of uh, of a certain sort. We, we enjoy our sartorial splendor, uh, and we like to make sure other people enjoy it, too. Um, <laughs> so it's only appropriate that there would come an episode where we talk about clothing in the canon. Um, you want to talk about the inspiration for this episode? Because you're the one that, that brought this idea to the table. It's wonderful um, when you look at the amount of scholarship done by Sherlockian societies around the world. And the nice thing, and this, of course, is featured in many publications and collections of the Baker Street Irregulars and others. The nice thing is when someone does the editorial work for you and looks back over months or years and pulls together, gee, these are the best articles. And one such organization is the Sherlock Holmes Society of London, which has produced two volumes that are now very hard to find, although I think volume two is still available. The best of the Sherlock Holmes journal. And in that uh, esteemed publication on page 214 of volume one of the best of the Sherlock Holmes journal, you will find a lovely paper, Clothes Canonical by Ronald Sherbrooke Walker. It's a paper that was delivered before a meeting of the society on the 9th of October, 1963. So some 60 years ago at the Royal Commonwealth Society. And Ronald Sherbrooke Walker's done a lovely job of sharing his experience, his notes of various stories and uh, what, uh, what stands out. So that's the inspiration for this little discussion. Perfect. Well, we obviously have covered incidents where Sherlock Holmes gets uh, attired in disguises. We have a whole episode dedicated to that. As a matter of fact, we have a link to that episode in the show notes. 
Um, but here we're talking about day-to-day -day attire, street attire, or the attire that clientele might be wearing when they visit 221B Baker Street. And one of the most prominent, almost straight out of the gate, is in the Red-Headed League. We meet none other than Jabez Wilson, who is, um, well, he's, he's a rather flamboyant fellow to begin with, and his state of attire uh, certainly does him no favors either. <laughs> What, what do we know about Jabez Wilson and how he showed up at 221B Baker Street? It's a lovely scene, and it's always fun to go back and reread it. Um, Watson points out that he bore, when they first looked at him, an expression of extreme chagrin and discontent upon his features. And Watson comes to a conclusion. He, he tells us he was an average, commonplace British tradesman, obese, pompous, slow. He wore rather baggy gray shepherd's check trousers, a not over clean black frock coat unbuttoned in the front, and a drab waistcoat with a heavy, brassy Albert chain and a square pierced bit of metal dangling down as an ornament, a frayed top hat and a faded brown overcoat with a wrinkled, wrinkled velvet collar lay upon a chair beside him. Now, a few things in that stand out to me. Uh, first, the just his his general appearance, where Watson says, um, "Not over clean, <laughs> black frock coat, <laughs> not over clean." Uh, so it was. It, he clearly uh, worked in the in the used in in the junk industry. He was a pawnbroker, right? Um, and and as you say, he. Um, his um the, the the frock coat even for a, a pawnbroker's business uh was was clearly uh part of the uh, the get up there now gray shepherd's check trousers do you have any familiarity with shepherd's check well yeah i think it's a it's a rather large check uh you know and you can still find these trousers sometimes you find it's part of a chef's getup. Exactly. I think it's part of work work trousers. Still, still today has survived. Yeah, yeah. it's it's somewhere between a gingham and a hound's tooth. Basically, if you took those, if you took a gingham and a hound's tooth and and overlaid them, I think it, that's what you'd see in shepherd's check. Uh, we'll have a an image in the show notes to show you exactly what shepherd's check is. So. In, in the Granada series, I think they, they subdued it a little bit. They had a very loud waistcoat. Uh, they had the frock coat with the velvet collar. Um, and they had these pants that were more of a, um, a, a window pane, uh, I, I think it was. So it was a little less gaudy because let's face it, a shepherd's check pair of trousers would not have shown well on the screen. It would have been very distracting and uh, mm. just too loud for uh, the visual medium. But in, in the, in the written form here, Watson does a wonderful job painting a picture of what a ridiculous, uh, ensemble this was that Jabez Wilson threw together. Uh, yeah, and it makes you wonder if in his pawnbroker shop, if he dealt in secondhand clothing at all. Oh, that's a great point. I never thought of that. Well, you know, you can, you can draw a lot from this despite the obvious, because what's going to happen in the story, of course, is that Watson has drawn some conclusions about this fellow and Holmes, you know, you read this description, you say to yourself, well, gee, that's pretty complete. Details about cleanliness, about a wrinkled collar, that's pretty complete. Square bit of metal. But Holmes is about to extract so much more information due to his superior skills. But the other interesting thing you can pull out of this, you know, you remember in another podcast in I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, we recently spoke to Nancy Springer Nancy Springer said, you know, the, the word imagination has got the word image in it. And the idea here is I got to put words down on paper that cause some pictures to spring up in my reader's minds. Yeah. Well, this is just, this is just a beautiful collection of details that Watson has provided. And if you want to look beyond Watson to the literary age and Arthur Conan Doyle, you can draw some conclusions about him too in, in constructing his characters. He paid particular attention to these small details. And there's an enormous number of details here before Wilson even opens his mouth. You know, you get, you get word after word about what this fellow is wearing that just sort of squarely 
allows you to build a picture of him in your mind. It's just lovely. And it's tempting to simply gloss over that as, you know, just a quick descriptor of uh, one of our characters here. But if you really do spend time with it, um, if you go over those words and if you pause and really get a picture in your mind as to who this was, it really does help paint a picture for uh, what Holmes and Watson uh, were facing in this particular episode. Um, why don't we move on to another city dweller? Alexander Holder, who, of course, came to Holmes and Watson in uh, The Barrel Coronet. This is, to me, this is one of the uh, the openings of the story that uh, stands out. Holmes, said I, as I stood one morning in our bow window looking down the street, here's a madman coming along. It seems rather sad that his relatives should allow him to come out alone. My friend rose lazily from his armchair and stood with his hands in the pocket of his dressing gown, looking over my shoulder. It was a bright, crisp February morning, and the snow of the day before still lay deep upon the ground, shimmering brightly in the wintry sun. Down the center of Baker Street, it had been plowed into a brown, crumbly band by the traffic, but at either side, and on the heaped-up edges of the footpaths, it lay, it lay as white as when it fell. Um... Blah, blah, blah. A man of about 50, tall, portly, and imposing, with a massive, strongly marked face and a commanding figure. He was dressed in a somber yet rich style, in black frock coat, shining hat, neat brown gaiters, and well-cut pearl-gray trousers. Yet his actions were absurd in contrast to the dignity of his dress and features, for he was running hard with occasional little springs, such as a weary man gives who is little accustomed to set any tax upon his legs. As he ran, he jerked his hands up and down, waggled his head, and writhed his face into the most extraordinary contortions. Well... Enter Alexander Holder. You- <laughs> well, yeah, but you need to cap you need to cap that off because in a few more sentences he's about to begin beating his head against the wall <laughs> and then falls, you know, just prostrate on the floor and and he, uh. he can't get the words out and he speaks to Holmes and he says, "No doubt you think me mad." And then one of the funniest lines I think in the canon <laughs> after this incredible scene is is uh, is uttered by Holmes who says. I see that you have had some great trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Master of the understatement. Yes. Uh, Captain Obvious. Oh, yes. wonderful. So, uh, what, what a lovely coat you're wearing. <laughs> yeah. Somber yet rich style. Black frock coat, shining hat, pearl gray trousers. Wonderful, right? I mean, this is the typical dress of an English gentleman of the time. But but brown gaiters? I yeah, mean, I was struck by that too. Why not gray? Wouldn't one's gaiters be gray? Right, well, well, maybe not. Maybe well, the whole purpose of gaiters was to was to protect the patent leather of your shoes from mud and so on. Well, so maybe the idea was your gaiters would be mud colored. Are we confusing spats with gaiters? No. Oh, what's the difference? Well, gaiters are. That's like what uh, Grimsby Roylott showed up wearing, isn't it? Oh, you mean boots? Yeah. Like, uh, oh, well, it's a good question. If you look up gaiters now, you're only going, you're only going to see I'm masks. Ignorant. Gaiters strap over the hiking boot and around the person's leg to provide protection from branches and thorns and to prevent mud, snow, etc. from entering the top boot. Gators may also be worn as protection against snake bites. Oh, hmm. see, well, that's why Grimsby Roylott was wearing them. That should have told us something right there. Um <laughs> so be more to, of a contemporary. to me, it's like it's an extended spat, right? Because spats yeah. were were just kind of the like where the laces of the shoes are, basically, and the, and and the, the 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 top of the foot. This goes up the leg. So, you know, I, I, if you're if you're out in the countryside, right, getting ready to go hunting, of course, you or or, or just you know uh, uh, slumming it around in the marshes, okay. But maybe now, I was going to say maybe Holder just didn't have galoshes and wore these as he was going out in the snow. Well, it's interesting. I'm just looking online at Wikipedia, and there's an entry here in the Anglican Church. Gators formed a part of the everyday clerical clothing of bishops and archdeacons 
of the Church of England until the middle part of the 20th century. And they were also worn by some cathedral deans. They were made of black cotton, wool, or silk and buttoned up the sides, reaching to just below the knee where they would join with the black breeches. And the purpose so was originally practical since archdeacons and bishops were presumed to be mobile riding horses to various parts of the dia- hmm. diocese or archdeacon. Oh, Which sure. Is- here's, here's a picture of the Bishop of Litchfield and Vanity Fair from 1897 wearing his gaiters. Huh. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. So, you know, as a, as a banker, you know, I mean, you could see Alexander Holder with all of this other uh, attire fitting right in. But when you get down to the gaiters, that's really, it, maybe it fits with this beating of the head against the wall and the, uh, you know, strange running and no doubt you think me mad. I think there's a pattern here. Well, there is a pattern and it's, it's the basis of a future paper where we prove that Holder's bizarre behavior and particular distress was exacerbated by tight gaiters, which cut off the circulation of blood to his feet. <laughs> Well, we'll be back right after this word from compression socks. <laughs> <laughs> With each passing season brings another passing quarterly issue of the Baker Street Journal. This scholarly journal has been around since 1946 and each year produces four volumes, one for each season, spring, summer, autumn, and winter. And a bonus Christmas annual. That's right. That's five issues every year of the Baker Street Journal, which consists of some of the best Sherlockian scholarship around the world. In each issue, you can read authors, people like yourself from all around the world and all around the Sherlockian societies who write in with their theories on Dr. Watson's bullpup, Sherlock Holmes' proficiency on the violin, the appearance of Mycroft Holmes and Mrs. Hudson, and more. If you can imagine something interesting to write about in the Sherlock Holmes stories, then someone probably will. In the Baker Street Journal. Are you subscribed? Get over to BakerStreetIrregulars.com and make sure you are part of the BSJ tradition today. All right, we are back talking about clothes in the canon. Uh, we left off with Alexander Holder. Where, where do we pick up next? Oh, I think we can um, briefly look at Colonel Sebastian Moran, you know, because mm. we have there an, uh, an entry about gentlemen in evening dress. And, of course, you know, the lovely thing about Holder, whom we've just spoken about, is here is this portly, imposing man from, from – uh, the British banking. And I mean, he's, he's a very uh, senior executive type of the day. And, and look at the contrast between his behavior once he gets into the Baker Street room. Well, here's another lovely contrast, a gentleman in evening dress who happens to be uh, in an empty house <laughs> about to shoot an air rifle at Sherlock Holmes. But an opera hat was pushed to the back of his head. Now, an opera hat is a top hat that was also collapsible so that you could put it under the seat in the opera and have no no issue in opening it up and so on. It wouldn't be in your lap all evening. And an evening dress shirt front gleamed out through his open overcoat. Hmm. And, and clearly he was so attired either because he was coming to or from the opera <laughs> or he just wanted to fit in better into into the district since uh, he was attempting to be discreet. I think you have something there in the second supposition because this is exactly the um, uh, excuse Holmes and Watson used when they were raiding Milverton's household. Uh, Holmes suggested that they put on – uh, their evening dress, which of course was white tie and tails, uh, so as they uh, should appear to be theater goers coming home from a show, uh, again to blend in with the crowd. If they put on, oh, I don't know what burglars typically wear, but if they were wearing gaiters or or garden attire, um, they would have looked a little out of sorts in the evening. Now, yes. I, I want to pause a moment here because something came to me. On this uh, scenario. So Holmes says, uh, Watson, have you got any black silk to make a couple of masks? 
Holmes and uh, Watson said, of course, of course I do. Oh, I don't know where Watson is getting bolts and bolts of black silk from that he has it sitting around for a mask. Uh, maybe it was from Mrs. Watson's boudoir. Uh, who knows? Um, but after the uh, the evening attire phrase, Holmes also asks Watson if he has any uh, any uh, silent shoes. And Watson said, I have rubber-soled tennis shoes. Can you imagine Watson roaming around in the evening wearing white tie and tails and tennis shoes? I mean, <laughs> that would have been the big giveaway right there. Yeah, that's true. I never thought of that. I wonder, you know, we tend to think of tennis shoes. Well, they must have been. I guess I was just thinking for a second. I wonder what the color of tennis uh, shoes was. Holmes, I have a pair but of Chuck Taylors. Must, <laughs> must have been white. They must have been white. Right. right. That's what I'm thinking. And yeah. You know, because they must have gone with the tennis attire, right? The white sweater, the white, uh, white trousers on the tennis court. <laughs> Um, See, this is this is so interesting because it it leads to the opportunity, well, both for some fun, but also for some papers, you know, about about things about you know why is it Watson had black silk candy? How was that used? And the other thing is maybe there's an argument too. It could be that Colonel Sebastian Moran frequently went to the opera with an air gun just in case the performance <laughs> wasn't up to snuff, <laughs> and, that, and that he was feared at the opera house. You know, whenever he. Uh, he turned up. All of a sudden, you see the tenor just seize up on the stage. Whoa! What was that? Did anyone hear anything? I... <laughs> oh well, why don't we why don't we take a look at uh, one more uh, outfit in the canon uh, here? Uh, th there are many others in this paper, but uh, we have limited time in the episode. And and for fairness' sake, why don't we look at uh, a lady's attire instead? Oh, yes. Now, my favorite is Mary Morstan, you know, because here again, you can read so many interesting things. Just think about this. You know, here's Watson's observations about a woman who comes into Baker Street. But also, what does it tell us of uh, the literary agent? If you want to think about Arthur Conan Doyle for a bit, who, as we know, had a great many sisters and was devoted to his mother. And so was very well acquainted with the attire of women. Watson observes... Mary Morstan entered the room with a firm step and an outward composure of manner. She was a blonde, young lady, small, dainty, well-gloved, and dressed in the most perfect taste. There was, however, a plainness and simplicity, simplicity about costume, which bore with it a suggestion of limited means. The dress was a somber grayish beige, untrimmed and unbraided, and she wore a small turban of the same dull hue, relieved only by a suspicion of white feather in the side. Now, isn't that just a remarkable collection of sentences and words? Mm. There? Relieved by a suspicion of white feather in the side. I mean, clearly, we don't have to read any more to know that Watson has noticed Mary Morstan. Yes, yes, indeed. Small, dainty, well-gloved. Dressed in the most perfect taste. I love that. And how he's very specific about how it's untrimmed, unbraided. It's very simple uh, in its taste. And you think about the type of woman that would be attractive to Watson. Here's Watson uh, having experienced women on three continents, having seen uh, you know, violence and war and, and having been injured, seeing great adventures with Sherlock Holmes. But when he comes home, of course, he wants... Uh, something simpler, something less adorned, something less fussy. And Mary Morstan uh, completely represents that in her outfit. The whole thing, the whole scene is beautifully put together. And that plus her conversation and what she notices and the way she describes the events of the case lead Holmes in a, you know, in a few paragraphs to observe, you know, you are certainly a mobile client. And that is just a trifle. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Please join us again next week for another installment of Trifles. Show notes are available on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out our longer show, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where we interview notable Sherlockians and share news of the Sherlockian world. 
You've taken my breath away, Mr. Holmes. And the writing? What else could be indicated? By the right cuff, so very shiny for five inches. And the uh, left sleeve with the smooth patch near the elbow where you lean it on the desk. 